what would be my top five things to consider if I was gonna buy my Land Rover Defender again? Let's get into it in this video. As you may or may not know, if you don't watch the channel regularly, I have no experience in mechanics or ownership of cars like this, but I decided to buy my Defender about two years ago now. And since then, I've done quite a lot to my car. I've joined the community of Defender owners here in the UK, and I found it a massively rewarding experience and a really fun journey, slowly modifying my Defender. So this video is not a structured buyer's guide. It certainly doesn't have all the things to look out for and the pitfalls when buying a Defender. But I think from someone like myself, when I was buying one, this is what I would have liked to know about the different variety of Defenders and considerations I think are important when you're thinking of buying one. I'm gonna cover some really key things, and particularly towards the end of the video, a very key point, so make sure you stick around until the end. So my first key point when picking a Defender, having learned how many are stolen, how many are chopped up and put back together again to be sold, is make sure your VIN number is matching throughout your car and on your V5 logbook. So when you're looking for that VIN number on the chassis, it's down here on the right hand side and if you go up to there you can see i won't show you here on youtube but it's basically along that chassis arm there you can clean it up and see it and then also there's one plate in the bonnet as well make sure those pieces are matching when you um, choose your defender make sure it's matching with the v5 because these cars are chopped and messed around so much that you want to make sure you're actually getting a good model that's actually the original parts all put together the next is to understand the differences between the engine types that the land rover defender was produced in and what depending on that really is what year you're buying into i went for a land rover td5 defender this was the 2006 7 car. There is, after that, the Pumas that were in production until the end. And that was a Ford engine. It was actually a transit engine that was put in the Pumas. But that car has very different characteristics to what a TD5 does. And prior to that, the TDIs as well. So depending what engine and what year you're looking for will determine what kind of experience you're probably going to have owning a car. I can really only speak on behalf of a TD5 and a Puma because they're the cars that I've driven. I don't know much about the TDIs. So any input about people that own those cars, let me know in the comments below. So the difference between a TD5 and a Puma, as far as I'm aware, really, is the Puma is much easier to live with. So if you're looking for a car you're commuting in, if you're doing long distances in, you want a bit more comfort, that higher gearing ratio helps you cover longer distance at speed in a more quiet fashion. I think the Puma's a better choice. The TD5, I think, is more charismatic of the Defender. Many people say the TD5 was the engine that best suited the Defender, and I'm, I'm tending to agree with that. Having bought a TD5 myself, the options for aftermarket tuning, I do a lot of stuff with a live tuning, as you can see, um, such as the remaps, the turbos. There's a lot more modification when it comes to engine sort of upgrades you can do with the TD5 that you can't do on a Puma. And one of the biggest things between the TD5 and the Puma is the exhaust note. So I've got a standard exhaust on my car at the moment, but I know if I go for an aftermarket system or get a cat delete, the sound on the TD5 is amazing. It's probably the best sounding Defender ever produced. So the TD5, depending on what you're after, is a car of choice probably for more someone that uses it off-road, someone that's more of an enthusiast at weekends. I, although I could commute in my Defender TD5, I don't. If I did, I'd want to do a few more things to it, like change a transfer box to a Discovery one, just to make it run a little bit better on longer distances. I think it's more uh, of an involved car, the TD5, although it is less comfortable, it's less nice inside, the dashboard is certainly more simple. So you have to see both read really, to decide on what's best for you. But I think if you're using your car daily and you want something that's a bit more modern, the Puma is definitely your car of choice. So things you'll know about TD5 from the exterior, if you're looking at one, the biggest one is, well, they have the badging just here, or well, some of them do at least, and it has the flat bonnet, not the humped kind of muscly bonnet. A lot of people change their bonnets on the TD5 to have the Puma bonnet. I quite like it being the original flat one for the TD5, but I'm interested to know, what do you guys think? Should I change that to the humped bonnet? Should I get a Puma bonnet for my Defender? They're definitely more nicked than the, these um, bonnets, that's for sure, but let me know what you think. 
The other thing to talk about is the body type for your Defender. Now, when I bought my car, I didn't know so much about this, or at least so many of the other options that come with the different body types. So mine was a van back. It was a light goods vehicle, is what it's classed as. Although it's had the windows cut into it, it originally was completely panelled out. And when I was looking at Defenders, I thought, actually, that doesn't make a huge difference. And in truth, it doesn't. You can cut the windows into it. But there's a lot of additional extras, such as the internals that you get with a station wagon with the windows in the back. And that is things like the headliner. It's things like all the finishes around the rear windows. And although it doesn't sound like a lot, in the Defender world, things like a headliner are the best part of 800 to 1,000 pound if you want to get an aftermarket one. So it's a really big cost saving if you're thinking of making that conversion to your car. If I was going to buy again, I would go for a station wagon, actually rather than a van back. The other options are things like the XS spec and if you want things like air conditioning, electric window, the XS spec is what you want to go for. Mine is not, mine is a completely basic spec. It's only had central locking added as a, an additional extra in aftermarket. It doesn't have air conditioning, it doesn't have electric windows. Not a huge problem, it doesn't particularly bother me, but I think if you want those kind of mod con comforts, you want to be going for the XS spec when you're choosing your Defender. You can add those things aftermarket. You can quite easily put them in afterwards, but it's quite an expensive thing to do in comparison to just buying it probably up front. The other thing to note is things like heated seats. Like if you have heated seats, I don't know, it depends what seats you go for, but most of the time, the seats that the Defender came with are not the best and you're probably gonna to wanna to upgrade them at some point and you can easily upgrade a heated seat when you don't have them previously. So mine, for example, is not a heated seat car, but when I do upgrade the seats, which will hopefully be soon on the channel, that will have a heated seat element into it and a button. One good thing about my car being a van is that it's, um, these are the windows I've cut into it here and here, is that these are much, much better on tax. The downside with that is, which I only found out after having a Defender, which was a van, is that these cars, you cannot use your no claims bonus on. So if you've got your no claims bonus on cars, you can't transfer over to this because this is a van. And I don't think you can transfer them back either to a car. So it's something to think about if you're thinking of getting insured and you're young and you're buying a Defender. Also at this point, if you want a really, really good buyer's guide and technical review of Defenders and what to look for when it comes to underneath the car and oil and all the kind of mechanical side of things, go check out a video on YouTube by a company called Juice Motors. The guy that owns it's called Sam and he's done an unbelievable buyer's guide for a Defender when it comes to checking out all the mechanics that you'd want to know. It's probably the best video on YouTube when it comes to being a buyer's guide. Get a car that's been untampered with. Probably one not like mine now. I've done loads of stuff to it. And that's because you want something at a complete basic spec. You really want to get like an old farm vehicle, ideally. Something that's been looked after mechanically, but hasn't necessarily been completely cosmetically modified. Just so you can have a fresh starting point and you know everything that's been done to it. These cars are hobby cars. People work on them a lot themselves. And that can be a good thing, but it can be a bad thing, such as my car probably. But I think you want to be choosing one that's completely untampered, a fresh start that you can start doing bits to it and you know all the history and what's been done to it over time that includes things like engine remaps you don't want a car that's been remapped and changed and performance parts put into it unless it's been done professionally and that's because sometimes those things aren't done very well there's a lot of companies that do remapping and tuning that probably aren't as reputable as others i think it's important to pick a car that you know the history of in regards to those things if you want to do it then you can choose how to do that yourself and i definitely recommend getting all those things done professionally checker plate so although checker plate can look good and does protect like the wing tops you really want to avoid a car with checker plate if you're buying it let's say over 10 years old which is pretty much most defenders now at least sub 50,000 pound it is and that's because checker plate typically is used to hide corrosion so you'll often see it along the bottom of the doors on the sills on the rear quarter pieces and that's because those areas are prone to corrosion and the last thing you want to do is buy a car that you think looks great because it's been covered in checker plate but actually that's all been done just to hide corrosion so that's a really important point to make sure when you're looking at your car rust is top of your list because these cars rust everywhere and some of the rust is fine, it's surface rust, you can kind of see where it is. The great thing with Defenders is you can get under them and you can have a really good look around. Even if you're not mechanical like myself, you can still have quite a good go at making sure that it looks at least surface rust and in decent condition and not crumbling and falling apart. So as you can see, mine's been tampered with quite a lot. I like to think I've done a good job of it, but still, if you're buying one, you probably wanna go for one that hasn't had anything done to it, like mine was originally, so you can put your own mark on it and do your own thing. So checker plate for cars are usually put 
along this bottom edge because the bottom of the doors often rust out. And again, you get a little kind of rear bit here, a checker plate, just to hide that corrosion along there. And sometimes even in the worst cases, the whole rear cross member is checker plate. And that is just to stop seeing all the corrosion that comes on them. You will see on the cars, and this has all been resprayed, but you will see a bit of surface corrosion. And even under mine, there is some corrosion in some elements of it. This is all kind of lanagard and waxed to stop it rusting. And if you're looking at one and the guy said, oh, you know, it's, um, it's been wax oiled regularly, it's been protected regularly, that can be a good thing, actually. You just want to make sure it's not there covering anything up. So take like a rag or something with you, lay under the car and have a look. And finally comes the most important thing, which is what are you actually buying a Defender for? What are you looking at using it for on a daily basis? Because these cars are used by everybody and to the frustration of some members in the Defender community. For example, mine, that often gets called a Chelsea tractor, at least it was at the last show that I went to, is a car that I wanna keep. I don't off-road in my Defender. And I'm, I'm gonna say that right now on YouTube. I don't do off-roading in my car. It's done a smaller bit of off-road. Its previous owners have definitely off-roaded it a lot. Mine had five plus owners and it's quite damaged underneath. So it's definitely been off-roaded, but I don't off-road in my Defender. I wanna upgrade my Defender, get it as nice as it is to drive on road. I love the looks, the style of the Defender. And really at the moment, these cars are an investment. They're going up and up in value. I don't wanna take one off-roading and get it completely trashed. So for me, that's my personal opinion. That's what I do with my car. And that does frustrate some people that are big in the off-road scene because they think Defender should only be used off-road. But the problem is with them at the moment, with some of them trading 40, 50, 60,000 pounds in the, in the kind of higher tier, it'd be foolish really to take these cars off-road and smash them about. One of the biggest things about owning a Defender for me has been involved in the community. There is such an amazing community behind these cars. So many people love them. They're definitely a car that suits everybody. Everybody can have a Defender. When you go to a show, you see such a variety of different people that own these cars. And for me, I've absolutely loved the experience. I'd be really interested to hear your thoughts on things that you would look for if you were going to buy your Defender again. Let me know in the comments below. Check out my other videos here on YouTube and I'll see you guys in the next video. Thank you.